Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak at this event. We've heard uh, this morning that we live in times of regulatory change, and uh, as a former regulator, I can assure you that regulation in insurance and pensions is particularly complex, because it is highly political, because the impact it has on society. And in my paper, I look at the important changes in the European Union in, in the insurance area, but also in the area of pension funds, and then to follow up on the issue of uh, risk disclosure. We have in the European Union started with a reform, and the question is why do we need this reform? Well, because the last reform took place 30 years ago, which may not be a valid argument, but the world has changed, unfortunately, since then. There was a need for a regulatory update already sensed in the beginning of the century of the capital market crisis and the overextended investment by insurance undertakings in equity, uh, which led to, to major losses uh, at that time. Also, very remarkably, is the fact that the insurance sector is the only major in economic sector that still does not have an international accounting standard, nor does it have an international solvency standard. And as we heard from Olivia this morning, uh, even today, it's being questioned whether we, we do need that, and particularly in the US, this is highly controversial. And after the last financial crisis, of course, we saw in Europe that reforms are really needed. Now, is there a problem? Well, the problem with the present solvency regime in Europe, which is not exactly RBC, as you have it in the United States, the present regime solvency one is not sufficiently risk sensitive. And that means that it does not give an incentive to management to apply good risk management, which appears rather strange in insurance. Also, what we found out in Europe is that unless you change the regulatory framework, the behavior of the insurance industry is not going to change. We also have today a fear in the regulatory community that unless we update the regulatory framework for insurance, a lot of the business that was traditionally conducted by the banking sector is going to move to insurance because it is less regulated, and therefore it's important to have a level playing field. And of course, we have a lack of comparability, both within the European Union and internationally. Is there... That is the Solvency II picture very briefly described, as you see, is a three-pillar approach of Basel II, with the quantitative pillar one, the qualitative pillar two, and the disclosure pillar three. In the European Union, of course, a lot of talk about capital requirements. We introduce a solvency capital requirement, a minimum capital requirement. There's a lot of talk about governance and risk management, the improvement of that, but particularly important in the European insurance industry is the increased transparency that will follow from solvency two. It will be the first time in European history that we will be able to compare insurance undertakings in fairly detailed amounts. And that is quite a reform which is, uh, which is, um, uh, which is important uh, to carry out. What are the main characteristics of Solvency II? Very briefly, market consistent valuation of assets and liabilities. And I know there was a very controversial issue when we started the project. Nobody questioned that. Everybody said that is the way to go. How can you deal with insurance liabilities if you don't mark them to market in the way you, you mark to market the asset side, otherwise you get imbalances between the two sides of your balance sheet. We apply a total balance sheet approach. We look at all the risks on both the assets and liability side. We have a confidence level of 99.5% for the solvency capital requirement, which is not a total, you know, a total guarantee. It means it is not a no-failure system. We have the possibility to apply, to use the, uh, an internal model to calculate the solvency capital requirement. Very interesting, in the beginning, insurance undertakings came to see the regulators and said, oh, fantastic, we apply our internal models. And then we looked at the models and we saw that they were not as sophisticated as some of the companies thought they were. A three-pillar approach, extended fully harmonized uh, powers for the supervisors, very important, and then group supervision, which in Europe is felt to be now to be at equal level as solo supervision, and that was not the case in the past. Where are we now in Solvency II? Very briefly, the process will start on the 1st of January 2016. It was a process in stages. The first stage was adopted, then came the financial crisis. We had to take a new look at that, and particularly one of the most difficult issues was the valuation of long-term liabilities. 
which is very complex, particularly as we felt in the beginning that we needed to apply a risk-free rate. And what was the risk-free rate at that time? It was the government bond rate. And Europe discovered very soon that even governments are not risk-free anymore. So there is not something anymore like the risk-free rate, so we have to find solutions on how to calculate that, and that took a long time, but it has finally been approved. We have now also work going on at the level of, of, of EOPA, and finally, everything should be in place by June of this year. Let's move on to pension funds. Pension funds has been always a tricky issue in the European Union because the um, member states of the European Union have the responsibility to design their pension regime. It's not for Europe to decide how the different pillars should be dealt with in each country of the European Union. That is a matter which belongs to the member states. And so the uh, adoption of the first pension fund directive in 2003 was already highly controversial. The objective of that directive was mainly to open up the market, to make it possible for a pension fund in country A to run a pension plan by a company based in a country B. That was not possible. What we also wanted to do at that time is to liberate investment policies. At that time, most investment uh, pension funds invested only in government bonds of their own country, of course, <laughs> and governments love that. So uh, we wanted to change that system also to uh, have more freedom, have more efficient system in the market. The pension fund directive was implemented, but as I show in my paper, these cross-border structures that were intended did not come about for a number of reasons. And it was uh, in uh, 2010 that the European Commission then decided to launch a new debate on pensions. The reason was that, in fact, pensions, you may say that the pension policy is a member state policy, but if you want to have a European Union with budgetary discipline, you also need to make sure that member states keep a discipline also in terms of their pension, uh, the way they organize their pensions. That's when the Green Paper came about, was uh, highly talked about, and it resulted then also in a white paper, and both these papers called for a review of the pension fund directive. Solvency rules for pension funds has been a quite complex issue, and I described that in, in, in some detail in my paper. The first thing is that we discovered fairly soon that a pension promise is not exactly the same as an insurance contract. At least in the European Union, there's a number of countries where the pension promise can be changed, which is not the case with an insurance contract. And that has important consequences if you want to develop a solvency regime. So the question then was, why did we not include occupational pension funds in the scope of application of solvency too? When a pension fund offers a defined benefit pension plan, under Solvency 1, or under the Pension Funds Directive today, we say it follows the same treatment as life assurance. So the question is, when you then believe that Solvency 1 does not do much good for life assurance, why do you then not do the same change for pension funds offering defined benefit plans? But that is something that needed to be looked at, could not be done with one stroke, as some people wanted. And therefore, the pension funds were left outside the scope, awaiting further examination, quantitative impact studies to see what would the possible impact be. EOPA did some examination on what it would be if a risk-based solvency regime were to be extended to pension funds. And they came up with this idea of a holistic balance sheet. And the holistic balance sheet is a balance sheet that is drawn up for the purpose of the solvency regime and which will include in the balance sheet the various mechanisms which we have in member states in the European Union, which could um, have uh, an additional type of security, for instance, a, a guarantee fund, a pension guarantee fund, or you could have a, a, a sponsor covenant, whereby the sponsor will pay for um, possible gaps in, in the funding, or in the balance sheet you could also include the benefit adjustment mechanisms such as we have, for instance, in the Netherlands, where it is possible to reduce pension benefits, well, that reduction can be included in the balance sheet. You need to estimate to value what that means in terms of the liability. 
So AOPA carried then out a first quantitative impact study, which showed important gaps. It showed that if you apply the discipline to the pension fund structures in the various member states, in some member states, there would be gaps. Classical example would be Ireland, which is the country with the most pension funds in the European Union. But in Ireland, there is a sponsor covenant, but the employer has no legal obligation to do it. So in that case, of course, if your pension fund has a funding gap and there is no legal obligation, that is a problem. European employer and employee organizations vividly opposed any change in the Solvency rules. And they did for different reasons. On the employer side, basically, it was argued if we change the system, it's going to cost us more money. And on the employee side, people said, it's not my problem, it's a problem of the employer. He made a promise, so he must be able to pay for it. So therefore, a lot of opposition did exist. And then when the Commission came out of its proposal to amend the Pension Fund Directive in 2014, last year, we saw that the Commission proposed governance improvements, risk management improvements, and transparency. Very important on the risk management side is the introduction for pension funds of a requirement to apply a risk evaluation, which is similar to the own risk and solvency assessment for insurance undertakings. In terms of transparency and risk disclosure, where are we here on the pension fund side? We need to recognize that in terms of public disclosure, a pension fund is different from an insurance undertaking. The disclosure that we talk about here is a disclosure, of course, to the supervisors, but also to the members of the pension funds. And because we now have in Europe a clear move away from defined benefits to defined contribution, it means that for the, D, the members of the pension fund with a DC pension plan, it's very important that they know what risks they are exposed to. They need to, to know, first of all, they are at risk. And that is something which the new directive, the new proposal from the Commission, will take care of through the introduction of what we call a pension benefit statement, which in detail describes two pages, not more than two pages, what the risk situation is for the individual member of a, D, of a uh, defined contribution uh, pension plan. The problem is that their logic was not extended to defined benefit plans. It is important when a member of a pension fund that benefits from a defined benefit plan, that that member knows how likely it is that the pension fund will actually deliver. And as I indicated, it is perfectly possible that because of the funding situation, that it is decided by the pension fund to reduce the pension fund. So just imagine you're a member of a pension fund, you're a retired person, and suddenly you get a letter from your pension fund, hereby your pension is cut by 10%. A little bit of awareness beforehand would have helped. So what kind of disclosure would you want to have? You want to know what, what is the likelihood that the pension fund will be able to deliver my defined benefit? Is there a funding gap? And if there is funding gap, what are the plans of the pension fund to do something about that? So a kind of awareness here is definitely important. Why has that not been included in, in the reform proposal? Well, no doubt because of the disagreement that still exists in Europe today about how do you calculate the liability? Because if you want to know whether it is a gap, you need to know what your liability is. But if you can't agree on how to measure the liability, you've got a problem. And that is an issue which is still outstanding. Today, as a result of the reforms in Europe, we'll have a situation there is no level playing field between an insurance undertaking selling a life assurance policy, which is subject to very detailed rules on solvency and investment rules, and the pension funds, which are not subject to the same rules if they have a defined benefit plan. If we were to extend, of course, the solvency rules to pension funds, I indicated in my paper, it would be very important, of course, to have a long transition period. Because the problem is mainly a problem of existing book of defined benefit plans. In Europe, going forward, the debate is more about defined contribution, DB, but we need to liquidate the existing book of defined benefit plans, which is a long-term exercise for which long transitional periods will be necessary. Thank you very much.